Well, good evening and welcome once again to the Concord Baptist Church Bible Study. I'm going to wait a minute to, or two here. Uh, we've been in chapter five of Dr. M. R. DeHong's book, Chemistry of the Blood. Now we're on the chemistry of the book, and we left off dealing with bacteria the last time we were in here. We probably have at least at least three, maybe four more sessions in the chemistry of the book. And it deals with Moses and the scientists. It deals with the commandments, horticulture, control of pests. Does that mean you and Megan? No. Uh, industries and morals, uh, women's dress. Uh, there's a lot, a lot left to this section. Uh, Moses, the astronomer, uh, Joshua's long day, the day the earth stood still, uh, gravitation of the sun, surgery, inspection, or I'm sorry, infection and hemorrhage. And, uh, and then the last part is a spiritual lesson from the book. So I've got a song I want to play for you. It's by Xavier Molina called The God of the Mountain. It goes something like this. Please worship the Lord with me. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But when things change and you're down in the valley. That's right, amen. He's the God in the Yeah, he is. Hallelujah! As kings and priests before the Lord, our 
he's gone in the night. I said, he's the God of the day. And he's gone. Yes, he's gone. In the Amen. I love that song myself. Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right, girls, you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. What are you doing? Old McDonald had a farm or what? Tell me the story of Jesus. Uh, okay. The story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart. again let's uh let's get started here let's have a word of prayer gracious heavenly father lord once again uh, we thank you for bringing us home safely lord we thank you for providing for us we thank you for services yesterday and lord we thank you for your long suffering your kindness and goodness to us we pray for all those that might be listening tonight Lord, I pray that they might get a blessing, Lord, from this old book. And Lord, we thank you for whatever you do. We give you the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we left off when he was uh, dealing with leprosy. 
And uh, we'll start there. I'll reread that verse and then we'll move on. It says, and when he had an issue, when he who hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in running water and shall be clean. Leviticus 15, 13. Now Moses says, or uh, Dr. DeHaan says about Moses, why do we call attention to these things? Because we are living in a day and age when it is considered smart to doubt the word of God. Those who still believe in the infallibility of the Bible are considered old fashioned and odd. Our youth is taught that the Bible is only a book of religion. While there is much of value in it, it is not necessary to believe all of it. They hear it in the schools and even in the churches. I'm not trying to defend the Bible. It needs no defense. It can stand on its own record, but I am bringing these messages in the hope that many of you, especially those of school and college age, may face the flood of atheistic teaching and propaganda in the firm conviction that we need never to apologize for being old fashioned enough to believe the whole Bible and that the real ignoramus is not the simple soul who dares to believe God, but he is the fool who would accept the theories of man instead of the word of God. For heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, said Jesus. God has given us his word. By, his, by this word, we shall be judged. You cannot be saved and not believe the Bible as the record of God to man. In 1 John 5, 10, we read, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. O sinner, believe him today. God's word is, the, is truth, and it tells us so plainly. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten. Son of God, John 3, 18. You know, we were talking about this yesterday. These agnostics, atheists, communists, they infiltrated our schools, these liberals. They infiltrated our schools, our colleges. Did you know that Princeton and Harvard and the others were Christian colleges when they started out. But look at them today. Look what they're turning out. I mean, just look at some of the Democrats that came out of there. Hey, Ben, it's more like Democrats. But a uh, one that really, really gets to me is this guy. Who am I? Adam Schiff. I think if he had a brain, he'd take it out and play with it. All right, I'll get back to this, huh? But <laughs> I get my wife upset when I get on this stuff, but I see what they're doing to America. I see how they're trying to destroy our young people, take away our liberty. Do you realize that this whole thing with this coronavirus is to see how you would react and you reacted like they thought you would with great fear? and lack of trust in God. And then you waited for the government to do something about it. And all they're doing is testing us for when they want to set up the one world government. That's where we're headed. But you know what the good thing is? I won't be here. I'll be gone. And every other Bible believing Christian that believes this old 1611 King James Bible that trust that what it said about salvation, about their sin and receive the Lord Jesus Christ won't be here either. But I feel bad for those that are going to be left behind. You think about Noah's flood. Only eight got on board the ark. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Plus all the animals. What do you think was going on when the floods came and the rain was coming up and God had sealed the door and nobody else could get in. And there was one, only one way out through the window. 
on the top. You realize how they were screaming and crying and yelling when the water got up around their neck. There was nowhere to go because the earth was being covered and it was coming up and coming up and coming up. And the higher ground they got on, the water kept coming. That's nothing compared to what it's going to be like during the tribulation period. Where 90 pound hailstones and fire and brimstone are rained down from heaven. People wanting to die and can't. Begging the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and cover them, hide them from the wrath of almighty God. That's why I get upset with the Democrats and all these atheists and agnostics because they're taking away any hope that our young people could have. Our young people today, they don't even know who Jesus is. I mean, I'd never think, I'd never thought that it would ever come to that where if you ask somebody about Jesus Christ, all they could do is use him as a cuss word and not even know who he really is. We think about the Lord, you know, people think that because we believe this Bible that we're weird or peculiar. Well, we are. Bible says we're peculiar people. And peculiar people dress peculiar too. They're not out here running around like the world. You think about all these people today. I mean, I, I've seen women come in with shorts on in the Walmart and they're tattooed all the way down their legs and up their arms. And I'm telling you what, they might think it's art, but it's gross. And you wait to that tattoo that that young man had put on his arm of some lady. Wait till he gets my age and she's all wrinkled up. <laughs> hey, man, that ain't art. But uh, the Bible talks about tattoos, talks about making marks in your flesh over in Deuteronomy. But if you've already got them before you got saved, then God's forgiven you for that. Amen. I know a lot of preachers that had them before they got saved. But uh, I looked at today, I was thinking about, you know, small churches. People today want big churches. They're more interested in the money than they are the souls of the people, most of them. And uh, instead of telling them the truth, they're going to tell them what they want to hear. They'll change it or try to change it like they know Hebrew and Greek, and they don't. Don't believe them. They'll look it up in some Greek dictionary or Hebrew dictionary and try to tell you what this means and that means when you can read it in plain English and know for yourself what it means. Amen. Uh, I thought about Jesus of all the people that he ministered to. When he went to the cross, there was none with him. He only had 12 disciples and one of them was a devil, but he gave him the truth. Anyway, he went to the religious Pharisees and he laid them out, told them what they were, told them that they can pass land and sea to make one proselyte. And when they do, they make them a twofold more child of hell than they are themselves. And you look around at the churches today. They want the, the drums and the, the banging and clanging. And some of these singers come out there and, what they want to do is be noticed. They're not good enough for Hollywood or Mushville or Nashville. And uh, so they try to get their break on stage in the churches. They do it to draw attention to themselves. Most of them, you can tell the ones that are singing for the glory of God and those that are singing for their own glory. And uh, then if they get noticed a little bit and they can get to Nashville for instance, you remember the Oak Ridge Boys? Same stuff started out in the church, I think in Virginia. Until they got noticed and then they went with the world. We are a peculiar people. We ought to remain a peculiar people.
I'm going to move on before I get in trouble here. Uh, Moses the scientist. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Second Timothy 316. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Second Peter 121. The Bible is not only the book of God, which teaches man that he is lost and in need of salvation through faith in God's own son, Jesus Christ. But it is at the same time, the greatest book on science, which has ever been written to, to deny this is to admit that you have never carefully studied the Bible. There is no other book in existence comparable to the scriptures in both its accuracy and scope of scientific information. You know, I had people tell me that there's contradictions in the Bible. And, you know, I asked them, I said, show me one. You know what? They've never read it. They can't show me anything. They just took what somebody else told them. Isn't it interesting how people will just take what somebody tells them and believe it, but won't believe the Bible? Amen. Why are they like that? Because it helps them live the lifestyle that they want. And they could justify their conscience by saying, well, there's contradictions in the Bible. Man wrote the Bible. No, God wrote the Bible. Man penned it under the inspiration of the Almighty. Amen. By the Holy Ghost. If there's a contradiction in it, the contradiction is in your understanding. No greater thing could be done to improve our American system of education than to introduce a compulsory course of Bible study in our schools. You know that in the early years of this country, this Bible, this Bible taught math, science, English, amen. It was a school book too. Wholly apart from its spiritual content, the Bible contains more real literary value and truly scientific teaching than all other books taken together. It is the one book which never needs revision and would be on course, be one course in our schools in which it would not be necessary for the parents to purchase a new edition of the textbook each year. The Bible needs no revision. Men have attempted it, but with very poor success. The teachings Moses gave almost 4,000 years ago are still as modern and up-to-date in every detail as they were when written and are ahead of the age in which we ourselves live. Can you imagine students in our schools being taught from other textbooks written over 1,000 years ago? Imagine the medical student being taught the practice of medicine as it was 1,000 years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I was a young lad in the 50s, I remember my mom taking me to the doctor when we lived in Somerville, New Jersey. And the doctor would get me in there and set me up on the table. And he'd take this little metal thing with a rubber triangle on it. And he'd start beating me up with it. I mean, he'd hit my knees with it. And he'd tap my other knee with it. And your leg jump out. He'd take a, a light. And he'd look down in your ear. Then he'd look in your other ear and then he'd look in your eyes. Then he'd take a, uh, a stick and shove it in your mouth and tell you to go, ah, and he'd look down your throat. And you know what? Those doctors had more common sense than the ones today with all of this technology that we have. And they'd tell you what to do and you'd do it and you'd get healed. But since we run God out of the schools, run them out of the courthouse, run them out of everything. <laughs> you go to the doctor now, you know what they do? They're nothing but pill pushers, most of them. I'm not saying there's some out there that are good Christian doctors. Don't misunderstand me. And there's some things that we need them for as such as surgery, things like that. But most of the time you go to the doctor, they'll go in there and they'll sit there or have their nurse with them on the computer typing something in and then write up a prescription for you and send you home. Amen. And what if I fixed one of their vehicles like that? 
just came in, told them what was wrong, sent them back out. They wouldn't be very happy. But that's what they're doing these days. We need to get back to God. I remember when my second oldest grandson, Justin, uh, years ago, he was on vacation. He was skiing, snow skiing. And when he got home, he started having headaches, real bad headaches. And uh, we finally got him over to the hospital. And uh, he had blood on the brain. And they were thinking about sending him to Charleston or some other place. And uh, we went over there. And I can honestly say I was closer to God then than I am now. And that's a shame. But I was really close to God. And I went over there and got down on my knees by his hospital bed. And I prayed for him that the Lord would heal him if it be his will. But I prayed, nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but thine be done. And I prayed and said, Lord, you know what we want. We want to keep him around. And uh, we prayed and we got up and left. And I felt like God heard that prayer. And I can't remember, I'm rough on time, but I think it was the next day. All of a sudden, they couldn't find no blood. And I believe God touched that boy and healed him. The funny thing was that evening, the next evening, we came in and my son was there and his wife, Kathy, and the doctors walked in. <laughs> and uh, my daughter-in-law, she can have a sharp tongue sometimes. But uh, they came in and uh, they said, we don't know where the blood went. We don't know where it came from. We don't know what caused it. We don't know this. We don't know that. Two doctors. And they said to my son and his wife, said, do you have any questions? <laughs> and my daughter-in-law looked at him and said, why? You don't have any answers? <laughs> Amen. I mean, it was the Lord that healed him. Amen. And he's still good to this day. We thank God for it. But God, in his book, had healed others. And I reminded the Lord of that. I said, Lord, you've healed the blind. You gave sight to the blind. You made the lame to walk. You raised the dead. You healed the sick. I said, you said you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I said, if you did it, then you can do it now because these doctors don't know what they're doing. Amen. And praise God, he healed them. I thought I'd tell you that little story while we were on the subject. Amen. Moses was the greatest scientist who ever lived on every subject which he treats. He is an authority. And not one of his instructions given in the Pentateuch on medicine, surgery, hygiene, astronomy, psychology, or other branches has ever needed correction or revision. And yet, instead of the tried and proved truths of the word of God, men would rather believe the vaporizings of a man's hypothetical guesses that need to be changed with each new discovery than the simple record of the word of God. Instead of believing the simple and conclusive key to all knowledge given in the first verse of scripture, in the beginning, God created. What happened? Linda, what happened? It's gone. Are you still on? I lost the screen. We're having trouble playing this video. Oh, brother, not again. You reckon uh, Facebook didn't like it? No, I reckon you're plugged. You're plugged. We're going to have to end it and do it again. We we'll just text those people that were on there. It was only Kathy. Yeah, there's a dozen people watching. There's like 13 people watching. There's over a dozen people on there.
They see you, but they can't hear you. Right. They see you, but can't hear you. Or can they hear me and not see me? Huh? They can see you and hear you. I wonder what part they're seeing, though. It might be delayed. All right. Well, if you can hear me, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this evening. Lord, thank you for the folks that listen. Pray, Father, that they'd be with us again tomorrow evening when we come back. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tommy says he can still hear me and see me, but I don't know what we have here. Uh, they can still see and hear you. Am I still on there? Yes, you're still on. Go. Huh? Yes, you're on there. Go. I got a blank screen that says, sorry, we're having trouble playing this video. Okay, I see myself on the phone now. All right, folks. All right. We're done for tonight. We'll take it up in the morning. I mean, tomorrow evening. God bless you. Have a good evening. Amen.